Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Ballas and I teach at an independent school in regional Victoria um, and I'm really keen to share with you today some of my stories about teaching writing in the English classroom. It seemed remiss not to make reference to our current sort of trying times as uh, teachers in schools are dealing with COVID-19 and what it might mean to teach remotely. So I'm going to address some of that um, in my presentation as well. My school um, didn't close until Daniel Andrews gave the directive at the end of last term. So the final week of term one was quite hectic um, and term two is still feeling like a little bit of an unknown, but um, certainly lots of opportunities for creativity on behalf of teachers. So I teach, as I said, at an independent regional school. We're a laptop school, which gives us a bit of an advantage in terms of dealing with um, the current situation because our students have access to technology, whether that is the same when um, we're all sort of teaching remotely and students are learning in their own homes um, remains to be seen. But we're currently preparing for that possibility. And these are some of the questions that my school was considering at the end of last term. So we were starting to think about how we might support our students emotionally um, through, from a distance. Um, how many plan B's do we need to have in place when technology fails? Um, I was starting to test Zoom and I also had to play with Microsoft Teams with my year 12 classes, sort of sent them around the school. Um, they had a great time trying to use Zoom um, and Microsoft Teams, but we also kind of learned that there's quite a few challenges involved in connecting remotely and keeping class discussions happening as well. Um, and we're also starting to think about how we might complete assessment, particularly for our year 12s, it's hard to put those things on hold. So thinking about how we might authenticate year 12 SACs, waiting sometimes in vain for VCAR to give us direction about that um, and how we might prepare our students for an exam and, and will there be an exam? So there's lots of unknowns that schools are dealing with at the moment, as I'm sure you're in the same boat too as you're trying to figure out what will happen with um, your teaching rounds and your experiences of what it's like to be a teacher in 2020. Um, a little bit more about me. So I'm a head of English. I lead a team of English teachers across two campuses. This year I'm teaching Year 9 English, Year 9 Workshop, which provides support for students with particular learning needs and Year 12 English and Literature. Uh, I love writing about teaching. That's sort of been my saviour since I started teaching many years ago now. Um, and I'm sure I'll be doing a bit more writing over the next couple of terms too. So with that in mind, what I want to do today is sort of share some stories from my classroom. Um, hopefully hopefully you'll, that will give you some ideas about what you might take away on teaching rounds. Um, but it's not necessarily a sort of a how-to guide about how to teach writing. Um, one of the things that I've certainly needed to keep in mind at the current moment is that I'm constantly learning to teach again and again in different ways. Um, and that's been true throughout my career. So these are the sorts of questions that I want to consider with you today. Um, you can have a read of them up on the screen at the moment. I want to provide you with some resources or models or voices that you might be able to draw on um, to ensure that the writing opportunities that you're providing in your classrooms are generative rather than restrictive as much as possible. And thinking about how we might enable our students to be makers and creators of texts and not just consumers of them. And ultimately, I wanna remind you and remind myself because I need constant reminders about this too, um, that the language we use in our daily work as teachers matters. The language that we use when we design writing tasks or talk about literary texts or reconstruct curriculum documentation makes a difference to us and the way we feel about our work as professionals and of course it makes a difference to our students as well. So the first voice that I wanted to share with you today is that of Raymond Williams. 
who's been a really well, source of inspiration for me, particularly over the last few years. Um, and his concept of creativity as being a form of remaking is a concept that I'll return to throughout this lecture. So in The Long Revolution, Williams employs the term remaking to describe the creative process. He writes that the artist's way of remaking himself is, as in humanity generally, by work, which is remaking the environment and in learning to work, remaking themselves at the same time. So he does not describe creativity in this way to present it as a process of extraordinary or mysterious transformation. Rather, he seeks to emphasize that creativity is an integral part of ordinary everyday life. We change and change our surroundings through the creative act in a whole and continuous process, a dynamic process in which there are always new beginnings and new opportunities. And this is certainly true for us as English teachers and invigorating, I think, because it means that we are constantly engaged in the process of remaking our curriculum and pedagogy and that we can also remake or redefine our professional identities as English teachers. And certainly in the current moment, we are sort of recreating our classroom spaces as well. So if we think about teacher creativity as a form of remaking. So around the world at the moment, we're witnessing teacher creativity in action as we all try to do our best in a new and uncertain paradigm. And as we all grapple with this, we are reminded, as Neil Selwyn writes, about how irreplaceable the classroom space is. And I will certainly be lamenting the loss of mine if I'm teaching remotely from my study in term two. But there are opportunities here as well, as new communities of teachers form and share their creative practices more broadly than simply within their own school communities. Um, there's a possibility of feeling like a sort of a global community of English teachers since we are certainly all in this together. So there's plenty of challenges to grapple with, which means new opportunities for experimentation and reflection about what really matters. And yes, I'm trying to look on the bright side here. Um, my holidays, it's lucky I'm in isolation for the next two weeks because I've got a lot of preparation to do before we start back in term two. So one of the things that I'm thinking about is how I'm going to teach the happiest refugee to my year nine students next term remotely. Um, it's a new text for us too, so we don't have our resources all sort of set up and ready to go. So I'm starting to think about what the opportunities might be and how I might make connections between the ideas explored in Ando's memoir with my students' lived experiences in the present moment. I found this quote when I was flicking through the text again just the other day about, you know, this sort of strangely quiet moment after the storm had passed as Ando's family is travelling across the seas to Australia. Um, waves lapped at the boat, but it was as though there was no human cargo in the hold. We were scared to move, afraid of what we might find up on deck. Finally, from above, the hatch door opened and light poured in to startle us from our stupor. I think a lot of our students and teachers are going to be feeling a bit isolated and alone if we are teaching remotely at the beginning of term two. And text can be an opportunity to navigate those challenges and to provide context for them um, and opportunities to kind of share and, and talk about them and, and write about them as well. So the assessment task that my students will be completing in response to this text is to write their own memoir. And that was already the plan before COVID-19 happened. But for some of my students, the present moment might actually be the life event that they will want to capture in their writing. So I'm wanting to think about ways in which I might help them with that and use this moment as an opportunity to, to help them become better writers. So this notion of students and teachers as remakers. Um, so Raymond Williams' notion of creativity as an act of remaking is inherent in Bakhtin's idea that language is dialogic, that each word is half someone else's, and therefore words themselves can be remade, reappropriated and populated with new intentions. So my students and your own students, once you are on teaching rounds, already take it for granted that language is dialogic. 
This is particularly evident in the online worlds that many of them inhabit. Some of my students, for example, engage with others' words by writing fan fiction. They constantly share and reframe the words of others on Facebook. They use pictures to tell and share stories on apps like Instagram and TikTok. TikTok. So this is already familiar territory for them. You don't need to convince them. What they may struggle to accept, depending on their experiences of English, is that the English classroom can also be a site of creative remaking, reappropriating, and so on. So it is up, for us, up to us to open up spaces for this sort of creativity to happen. Uh, for example, next term, our Year 8 students will explore Stephen Herrick's first novel, By the River, which is a beautiful text, by creating a multimodal adaptation of one of his poems, using images, music, motion, words, and so on. They'll also be writing um, some poetry by creating a new poem to add to the text or by extending a poem that's already in the text. And through this process, Herrick's words will become partly somebody else's. Our Year 7 students began the year with a unit that we've called Humans of St Paul's, in which they've explored posts from the Humans of New York series and then created their own after interviewing their new peers. Our Year 9 English students produced creative responses to the film text Hunt for the Wilder People by creating new scenes, experimenting with writing haikus a la Ricky Baker style, or reimagining the lives of the characters in that film. It's a great film to watch if you are in isolation at the moment too. I thoroughly recommend it. So in this way, literature is always already continually necessarily being remade every time it is written or read. And this is why acts of reading and writing in English classrooms cannot be neatly separated. So to illustrate this, I want to take you back in time over 10 years ago now to my first year of teaching. The players in this story are a group of very disengaged Year 10 boys, a very green English teacher, that's me, and John Steinbeck. The details are a bit of a blur now, but I asked my class to work in groups to create a new text inspired by Of Mice and Men for revision purposes. It wasn't an assessment task, just a desperate act of a young teacher, possibly on a Friday afternoon, trying to buy herself some time. It was not an example of the best laid plans, I know that much. And while I can't remember the details, I can see the boys' faces as they shut themselves away in a meeting room near the classroom with a small keyboard with beat tracks, very old fashioned technology, and a laptop. And I hovered anxiously outside the door to check on them every few minutes while trying to keep my, the rest of my class under control as well. So this is what they came up with. Yo, Steinbeck, writing about Lenny and George here, yeah. And now it's time to jump into the rap out of Mass and Men, yeah. They want some respect, yo. Want some respect. Yo, Steinbeck, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's time, it's time for you guys. Here we go, yeah. How many dudes know stuff like Lenny? Not many, if any. How many dudes know Kate like Lenny? Not many, if any. How many guys know Gus's friend named George? It's Lenny, just Lenny. How many dudes know Sock just George? Not many, if any. That's where two they came from weed. Left town to hire the local work kids. The boy named Lenny was in sexy town. With the girl, so he got some backgrounds. Every one day was real, real mad, and George and Lenny both feel real sad. The two ended up near a lonely ranch. George and Lenny, yo, this is our last chance. One last chance! Yo, yeah, this song's complex. Lenny, Kelly, George, and Candy. Yo, what a mess. All the dudes got no respect. This is a big mess. No respect, no intellect. No respect. No respect. Well, tell me about it, kid, George. You know the dream with the rabbits and the bone and the rabbits. Rabbits. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! yeah. Woo! Holy shit, man! So, for me, this rap 
represents one of the first times as a teacher that I had planned for possibilities without really knowing what the outcome would be, but trusting when I saw the students responding that something good would come out of it. And I agree with those year 10 boys that this song is complex. It demonstrates an understanding of the text themes and character relationships that those students may have struggled to articulate in the formal text response essays that they had to produce as well. And I'm thinking of those boys a lot at the moment because I'm wondering what their experience of English might have been like at this time. And I'm wondering about how I might best engage the students that I teach for whom English isn't their favourite thing remotely. So this story illustrates for me some of the key things that I think matter when it comes to teaching writing in a classroom. That writing is a journey, that's a collaborative process between students and teachers, that students' voices matter. And particularly at this time, I need to be thinking about how I can privilege their voices and not fall into the trap of teaching in a more didactic fashion now that I'm teaching from a distance. Uh, it's a reminder that play should, the writing should be about play and experimentation and some of the best things come out of planning for possibilities without really narrowing down what the outcome might be too much. This is particularly important when you're dealing with competing voices. At the moment it's a viral outbreak but there are other competing voices that we always have to deal with as English teachers. So school imposed deadlines and timetable constraints high stakes assessment, such as NAPLAN, although we won't be worrying about that one this year, um, assessment and grading practices, measurement and how we measure student success um, in ways that might not necessarily represent who they are and what they're truly capable of, and um, state imposed curriculum documentation as well. So we have to reconcile and navigate and negotiate with all of these voices while still providing opportunities for creativity, experimentation and play. Because if we allow these voices to take centre stage too much, it helps to create voices like this. So you can have a read of those speech bubbles. Some of them you probably recognise from your own visits to schools or from your own experience as a high school student. Um, I hear these voices all the time, um, as every teacher does, and they reflect um, a culture that requires students to think about assessment practices, think about how their writing is going to be measured. Um, and these are things that it's difficult to get away from entirely. All we can do is do our best to, to minimise their impact as much as possible so that other voices about loving writing or enjoying creating a text like those you know once disengaged year 10 boys sit in my class many years ago um, those are the sorts of voices that we want to privilege and find space for so with that in mind i want to take raymond williams idea about creativity as a form of remaking and add a new voice to that, which has been really important to me um, over my career, Ian Reid's text, The Making of Literature. This is another voice or model that can provide you with examples of how you might ensure that the imposed lens or map doesn't take hold of your classroom space and allows teachers and students to be revisioners or remakers of their classroom and of texts as well. So Ian reads The Making of Literature, asks teachers to make a choice, to view literature as a canonical and revered product, best viewed, viewed from a distance, or to reimagine text as a frontier for play, experimentation and imagination. At some point this year, I'm sure you'll explore Reed's work through his writings with McLaughlin on different ways to frame or unpack texts, as well as this model for the English classroom. So Reed poses two models in this text or two approaches that you might find on teaching rounds, the literature gallery and the literature workshop. So firstly, we have the literature gallery. And this is Reed's description of it. Imagine a room as I describe it. At first it seems spacious, but a second look shows you that only its extreme tidiness has given that impression. 
everything has its fixed position, its proper place. The items on display are neatly shelved or arranged in glass cases. Each section is labelled and you can see little signs that say, for instance, novel, poetry, drama. Other signs request visitors not to touch, not to leave fingerprints. So hopefully this is an approach that you encounter too often when you visit schools. The idea of teachers being the curators in control of the text and students as mere onlookers. So hopefully that's not an experience that you see too often. So on the other hand, we have the literature workshop. So Reid describes it in this way. Imagine, if you will, a room for making. As you enter this one, you can see and hear that it's quite different from the gallery. It's messy and noisy because lots of people are busily at work. There's argument, joking, gossip. There's activity on all sides. One talkative group seems to be either dismantling something or piecing it together. Another is intently mixing ingredients. Several individuals here and there are bent absorbedly over benches, machines, easels, and desks. A multimedia experiment seems to be underway in one corner. A few are silently preoccupied with their reading, or is it their writing? And if there are curators here, it is hard to distinguish them from the rest. So for Reed, the experience of teaching and exploring literature is above all a social one. He writes that most learning occurs not as a private interior experience, but isn't as an interactive one that is socially shaped. So in the literature workshop, both students and teachers are makers and remakers of literature and of classroom spaces for that matter. So here's some example of what writing might look like in the literature workshop. Um, these are some found poems created by Year 11 literature students using pages from the boat by Nam Lee. You can see how these new texts are being created from the pages of Nam Lee's novel that reflects some of the themes and ideas explored in the text, but also create new possibilities as well. So the reason I'm sharing this model with you in a literature about the teaching of writing, as I said before, is that the process of engaging with literary text and writing are inextricably linked. And we should view students as creators of texts, not just consumers of them. So with that in mind, I want to explore another example from my classroom, um, teaching satire to a year 10 English class. Um, in our unit, exploring satire, we learnt to playfully resist and challenge dominant discourses and troubling ideas through the art of humour. So we explored a whole lot of different texts in this unit. We looked at online um, satirical news sources, such as the onion or the shovel. Um, we looked at various memes, mashups, parodies, um, explored a whole lot of different texts, some of which the students have found themselves in order to investigate what satire means and how it can be used to share an important message. As well as that, which was a lot of fun, we also did some traditional Englishy stuff in that unit as well. Um, for example, we learnt that, you know, identifying newspaper article conventions, looking at how texts like that are constructed is much more fun when you're analysing a satirical newspaper article rather than something that is more straightforward. So on the screen is an example of one of the texts that we looked at and um, analysed together. But we didn't just consume texts, we also created new ones. Um, one of the short activities that we did, for example, was to write the opening um, paragraphs of uh, satirical articles using headlines that we'd found on um, online satirical texts like the Batuta Advocate. Um, these short writing activities evolved sometimes into extended texts that were more formally assessed. We also created our own 
downfall parodies, um, some of which you, well, you might have seen similar parodies online that use um, clips from the film Downfall and then add using a, a, a tool like Movie Maker or iMovie, adding new subtitles down the bottom to produce a new text. We have lots of fun with that. Um, including one student who typically refuses to submit work for assessment, um, created a downfall parody, poking fun of Collingwood supporters and just loved every minute of it. So those sorts of opportunities to create new texts that they might not have um, had much experience of before in the classroom um, provide a genuine engagement. As well as that, they also learnt about um, important uh, new forms, uh, short films, websites, the sorts of conventions that um, are usually followed in those texts and then how they could playfully subvert and use those um, forms to create a point or a message. Um, there's one example on the screen at the moment. This is an extract from a newspaper satirical article that one of my students created. I'll just let you have a read of it. The student took a theme that was really important to her um, about representation uh, of race in um, popular culture and created this quite subversive text. Um, it continues here. I'll let you read that as well. Hopefully you're laughing while watching this in your living room. Another student created a website. So I've just got some snippets of that website on the screen at the moment. So she created a Bear Grylls sort of parody, poking fun at hipsters and hipster culture. Um, and I've just got on the screen some snippets from the website that this student created. Um, she created this new character called Tiger Pan, exploring um, dangerous places like, you know, in Melbourne and so on. So she had a lot of fun with that. And she just used a really simple program called Wix, which is a website creator that is freely available online. So it's a great resource to use with students as well. So by adopting the literature workshop model, we found that we were able to focus on creating possibilities and opportunities that will enable interest in writing and thinking to emerge. Um, we built in opportunities for writing and creativity and the students didn't have to worry so much about the constraining influence of assessment. But at the same time, we were able to satisfy Australian curriculum outcomes. For example, satire is explicitly mentioned in the Year 10 English content descriptors by Akara. And we had a lot of fun doing it and also tackled some challenges, including technological challenges as we um, engage with different forms of text, both students and teachers in it together. And I'm sure we'll have to tackle some similar challenges over the coming weeks as well. So the stories that I've provided and shared with you, hopefully will give you some examples of ways to resist holding too fast to the lenses that can limit what reading and writing can be in English classrooms and to open up spaces for creativity to take center stage in environments that can often feel constructed for us by institutions or dominant discourses about what English classrooms should look like, either from educational experts or government bodies or the media. So we need to use the ladders available to us as rich poem, Rich's poem infers to help our students use texts and words for their own purposes. And in this case, I think those ladders are the voices and readings that you encounter in this space while you're studying English education, the voices of the students and teachers that you will meet when you are visiting schools, and your colleagues and peers that you're um, learning with at this moment as well. 
So I'd like to finish by just encouraging you to take up the challenge to make the map work for your students and colleagues. Don't be afraid to go off road occasionally or look past the lens and focus directly on the students that are in front of you. And that is how we help them to remake their world. Thank you. Thanks, Nat.